He's an unlikely environmental activist. Alejandro Gag took a sharp turn away from Formula One to become a self-confessed electricity addict. Now he's revolutionizing motor racing. The first major shock came in 2014 when he launched Formula E, a fully electric championship. Now, disruption number two, an extreme E off-road series, which is not only facing up to the challenge of climate change, but gender equality too. Hello and welcome to Disrupted. Well, this is the show where we speak to people who are shaking up their industries and shaking up the way we think. Alejandro Gag, many thanks for joining us on the program. So, you have gone from politics to Formula One, and I think we can say you're a fully fledged environmental activist. That's not a usual career trajectory, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I don't, I don't know any any other one uh, like like this from politics to to car racing. Um, but yeah, uh, I I love politics. I started very very young when I was in university. Uh, I did it for many years. Uh, probably if I wouldn't got married with the with my wife, with that wife, um, I would probably still be in politics. That wife being? My wife was the daughter of the prime minister at the time in Spain. Uh, so I basically decided to stop politics in order not to have a conflict of interest with my family, basically. Not to work for my father-in-law. I, I really didn't like that, um, that plan. So I stopped politics. And then I had to look for a job. I had some friends in motorsport um, called Bernie Eccleston and Flavio Briatore. And they invited me to, to start doing things with them, and, and the rest is history. I started doing, let's call it normal motorsport. And um, I'm, I'm not an environmentalist from, from, from the start. I'm, I'm probably a, a new environmentalist, if you like. But I think it's very important that there are lots of new environmentalists. We need to make everyone an environmentalist. Well, as a new environmentalist, then, just tell me, how did the realization come to you that, you know, for you working Formula One as it was, was potentially untenable and you needed to kind of change. Did that just come like that overnight or was it, was it a gradual realization? Uh, it, was, it was both actually. So I always had a worry for the environment and uh, especially since I had kids, but I think this is what many people have. We read the news, we see documentaries and, and we, we, we realize that something is wrong. Uh, so I had that in my mind. Uh, second, I realized a commercial reality. Uh, sponsors, big corporations, were uh, withdrawing from in getting involved in, in Formula One because it was not a green sport. So I put both those two things together and I said, we should try to create a green version of what we're doing, a green version of motorsport. And that was how the idea came up. It's a big gamble though, isn't it? So, so how did you pull it off? And, and what is it about you that allowed you to pull it off? Because, you know, I, I don't imagine everybody was on board immediately. Well, not only everybody wasn't on board immediately, everybody thought, it was completely crazy. Everybody thought it was going to fail, we were going to go bust, and we were really close to go bust. And um, I don't know if it was me, it was just like, you know, when, when uh, you believe in something and you push and you think is the right idea, um, then sometimes it, you know, you, you, you're right and you get lucky or, I was almost too early, we almost failed, but we managed to survive and then the whole movement came behind us, a whole wind behind our, our, ourselves and we were able to, yeah, to grow it to the size it's now, and, and now it has become really a, a huge reality. It's a huge reality, and that's allowing you to look at new challenges, which is Extreme E. Now, that's going to be launched in 2021. Just tell us a little bit about that. Well, through Formula E, I really became more and more passionate about, about uh, climate action and about, uh, you know, the, the action for the environment, and uh, I thought we could do more with motorsport. You know, uh, of the most shown, uh, watched shows on television, are sports. Sports are bigger than anything else. A lot more people watch sports than environment documentaries. So I thought sport can play a role uh, to, to help people understand the message of what's going on around the planet. So let's take sport to those places where climate is affecting what's going on and show through sport what's going on in the Arctic or in the rainforest or you know, in the deserts, in the oceans, and that's extreme. So how, about, how are you doing that? How are you doing that, Alejandro? So I'm taking electric SUVs to show that electric cars are also a good option for off-road. To those remote locations, we have a ship, the Santa Elena, that is otherwise is impossible. You need your own transportation to go to those places. We don't want to fly things because we want to reduce the CO2 footprint also. And we organize these races there. We hope to have some of the biggest names in the off-road racing um, you know, world. And uh, with that, we organize these races all around the world, five races per year. In, in those locations. 
And what's the pickup? Are you, are you finding the same amount of support when it comes to something like this, which is taking on new challenges in terms of the environment, really driving it home as you would have done with Formula E? I'm finding a lot of support. I'm finding a lot of support. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really fascinating to see how more and more people really now want to get involved in this. Yeah. I'm also finding some resistance. Uh, some people say, oh, you shouldn't race there at all because that's not place for cars, you know. And, and you know, I think uh, that gives me a lot of motivation because there, there are a lot of negative people out there. There are a lot of people that just don't want to do anything, and I think that's wrong. Um, I always give the same example. We're going to have to use a lot of carbon. We're going to have to emit a lot of carbon to get out of the carbon age. For example, we need to make solar panels. We need to make millions of solar panels. That's going to produce a lot of carbon, but in the long term, it's going to get rid of the carbon. So the same thing with us. We have to promote electric cars. We have to make millions of electric cars. We have to make them more efficient. We're going to produce some carbon on the way, but at the end of the road. So the important thing is to take action. I, I really, I get very annoyed with people who don't want to do anything. OK, well, you obviously want to do quite a lot, but is Extreme E going to be carbon zero? Of course. But there is only one way to be carbon zero for something that emits carbon, which is to offset. Yeah. Well, there are two things. First, you try to emit as little as possible. That's why we use a ship instead of using a plane. We will uh, minimize the, road, the routes around the world, um, optimize them, and so on. But once you minimize the carbon you emit, you still have a footprint. That you have to offset. How? By planting trees, for example. By, by doing actions that, that, uh, that take carbon out of the, of the atmosphere with different, there are many different ways. And then you become uh, carbon neutral or even carbon negative. So, and you're going to go to areas that have been damaged by climate change. What are you doing to ensure that you actually don't create more damage once you've left? It, it, that must be of concern to you. We call our race, extremely race without a trace. When you, we leave, you don't see that we've been there. We have a scientific committee with some of the top scientists in the world that are focusing on environmental questions from Oxford and Cambridge University that first look at the situation on the ground and check, obviously, that you know, damage is not, not uh, done there. But second, coordinate our legacy program. In every place, we're going to leave a legacy. We're going to work with local communities, and we're going to have specific actions. It doesn't matter if they're small. We're doing something, which is my obsession is to do stuff, not to talk. And, um, and that's how we're going to guarantee that we race without a trace on those locations. And so it's just not electrification. It's not only environment, you're also doing something for equality when it comes to extreme E. And this really caught my attention because I think if you look at motorsport, it's very much a testosterone fueled yes. environment. And you're getting women in the driving seat alongside men. What was your motivation for doing that? Was it marketing or, or are you kind of, are, are you, do, do you kind of really want to take this challenge? beating sexism in the industry head on? You know, I, I think uh, that uh, equality is one of the big causes of this century. And, and I think that the parity between men and women is going to be, there's a lot of work still to be done there. And especially motorsport. My world is motorsport. I work on the things I do. I mean, I cannot have action in, I don't know, the fashion world or, you know, uh, the, 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 the pharmaceutical industry. I do motorsport. So I try to bring equality into motorsport. I tried like 15 years ago, I did a team in Formula 3 in Spain where I said, okay, I'm going to do a team with only women. And I did, I did a team with two women. But they were competing with the men and it wasn't successful. And I thought, this is not the right format. And since then, since 15 years, I've been thinking, what would be the best way to bring women, but on an equal term with men in motorsport? Because it's not good if, woman, if the woman is, is losing the race and the guys are on top of the podium. That generates even more frustration. So I thought, the idea came from tennis, from the uh, mixed doubles. The women and the men are equally important for victory. You know, the men can make the mistake and then they lose the game, or the woman can make the mistake. So I thought, let's make teams of a woman and a man where both do one lap and we do the races of two laps. Then it doesn't matter who was faster, if the man or the woman, both are key for the victory and they will be both standing on top of the podium. And actually now it's fascinating because now we're getting really into it. And I was testing two weeks ago with the, with, the, with the female drivers and the male drivers, and the male drivers were saying, the winning team will be the one that will get the best woman. Exactly, because women don't have the same experience in this sport. So there must be a huge disparity, isn't there, um, you know, between the best woman and maybe the third best? That is very interesting. So, of course, there are a lot of men, and because there are so many men racing, the ones that are going to race are really close to each other. Mm. There are less women in the sport, so the, 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 the difference between the best woman and the, and the woman that it goes a bit slower it's going to be bigger. Mm. So they're all looking all around the world for the best female driver. 
they, they were telling me female drivers have never felt so in demand as since we announced the, 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 the format of extremely uh, and, the, and the, you know, gender equality uh, uh, action. So I, I, think, I think it's already having a great result. Great television, but this is another issue. There's not going to be any spectators, are there? No, there is not. Well, there is not going to be spectators paying spectators. We, we think that in some places where there are locals, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, do some areas where the locals, like in the hill or something, they will be able to just come for free and watch. But no, there are no spectators. It's, it's, it's not for spectators. It's all for media. So there will be live broadcasting and there will be a documentary uh, side of it. Uh, but yeah, which, you know, we didn't really know about COVID when we, of course, when we launched Extreme E, but makes it ideal for this like COVID era where you cannot really have spectators. Uh, we, are, we are like a, I don't know, a COVID proof sport in a way. You're proving, and maybe this wasn't your intention, but a massive, becoming a massive disruptor when it comes to the industry. Are you thriving on that now? Is that something that motivates you? What gets you going in the morning? Uh, it, it wasn't really my intention, no. Um, so what really gets me going in the morning is, is uh, now to um, not disappoint the people who trust me. You know? So a lot of people put their trust in me, and I'm very grateful for that. So, but you know, the teams that, that sign up, they make investments and they believe that I will deliver a championship. Uh, the investors that back me, um, the televisions, the broadcasters that agree to broadcast our races, um, and at the end also the local communities, in this case, of these countries. We, we are going to, for example, do a program where we're going to plant one million mangroves in Senegal with the local community. We're going to restore hundreds of hectares of rainforest with the local communities in the Amazon. Um, so that's what really drives me, not to disappoint all those people. We, we, I have promised that I'm going to deliver this, this championship or even more, this, this kind of action that we're going to do all, all around the planet, I don't want to disappoint anybody. So that, that's really what drives me. And always that, that's what has really driven me, not to disappoint the people that put their trust in me. And is that something recent since you've really been kind of honing in on the environment? Has your attitude towards business changed as, as you've progressed along this path? Which has been really quite recent, really, because Formula E was only launched in 2014. Yeah. Definitely my, my attitude towards business has changed. Yeah, before my legitimate interest in business was of course to do well and make money with my businesses, which, which is the normal way to do it. Now it's a lot more about, of course, do a good business because if not, it's not sustainable, but to do business that can make, and you know, it, it's, it's kind of a cliche sentence, but you want to make the world a better place. If you can make the world a better place, then you know, when you're old and you know, I just turned 50, so I feel like a little bit older than three weeks ago, um, then you can be happy, if you, if you've been, even if it's a small thing, but if you have done something. Again, my obsession is doing, not, not talking, so, yeah. It, it just seems your drive to disrupt the industry across the board uh, has become almost an addiction. Are you, are you addicted to this now? Yes, I mean, it probably could be a, 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 like addicted to, to electricity. Uh, you know, once I've done one, it's easier to do another one. Uh, so when, when, they came, when we came up with the idea of Extreme E, because we had done Formula A, we said, why not? Now the idea of doing electric boats, we said, mm, why not? Now we are looking into electric planes also. So there are some options to do some things with electric planes uh, on sport. So we can electrify the sport in cars, in boats and in planes. Why not? If we are capable to do it, because we can raise the capital, because we have the know-how, because we have the contacts in the industry, the suppliers of technology and so on. Let's do it. I think it's a fun thing to do, it's a good thing to do, so, and it's also profitable, so, yeah. What about in terms of advice? You've said you've taken many risks during your career. What's the best advice you've ever received? Interesting. Uh... Probably not listening too much to the critics, you know, because uh, you, you, you have to listen to the advice and to the positive advice, even if it's negative, even if it's, but there is so much, uh, you know, so much negative opinion out there. Like so many people told me I wouldn't make it. If I would have listened to one, I would have just, or to, I would have gone to bed and just stayed there, you know. So probably, yeah, the best advice was listen, don't, don't listen too much to people who think you're going to fail. Many thanks, Alejandro Gaga. It's absolutely fantastic to talk to you, and it's really fascinating stuff. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.